Are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? Is the seat supposed to be forward-facing or rear-facing? Did they move to a booster seat too soon? It may be too late to check when you're on the road. Fortunately, you're on the couch. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Don't think you know. Know you know. Month's salute to service, and today I have with me Mr. Michael Paul. How, How are, are you, sir? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> and you're United States Air Force veteran. Yes, sir. Medina resident. Mm -hmm. You're not born and bred here, though, right? No, born in Detroit. So we got a visa for you, right? Right. I, I got I got a yep. visa too to stay here. Well, I so. wanted to call, come to Ohio because they told me it was high in the middle and round on the ends. So. There you go. There so you go. that's why we came here. So you were born and raised in Detroit many years ago, right? Yes. Yeah. Would you? Would you? Did you? Is that where you went to high school and joined the military? Uh, right. Uh, grew up in a suburb called Royal Oak, Michigan, mm -hmm. about two miles north of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, got out of high school, wanted to go in the military, picked the Air Force. Mm -hmm. and enlisted in August uh, 1960. So you weren't drafted, you, you no. went down and enlisted? No, I was 17 at the time. So what was going on 1960? That was after the Korean War, Vietnam was kind of, yeah. you know, not really... The Vietnam conflict hadn't really started, it was yeah. on the news a little bit, but yeah. not that much. Yeah. No. So you joined the Air Force, what did you do in the Air Force? Uh, I was, uh, after, after boot camp and school, I was assigned as a uh, support uh, troop for the F-106, which is a first-line aircraft. Okay, is that so like a jet or what? It's a, it's a single it's a single fighter jet. Okay. Uh, the mission, we were, I was stationed at Sarvage Air Force Base in Michigan. The mission was to shoot down any uh, Russian bombers coming over the North Pole. Oh, okay. We had two squadrons there. We had the 94th that I was attached to, which is the Hatton Ring, the mm -hmm. oldest fighter, fighter squad in the United States. Wow. The other one was the 71st. And so, I worked with the mechanics at the flight line, and any part that they wanted, they let me know. If it wasn't on the air base, then I could call anywhere in the world where we had F-106 parts. And they'd and send we, it to you. Th well, what we did, we would, I would, if I'd make the arrangements, we'd swap parts sometimes. And oh, then okay. I'd give the information to a captain, he'd make the flight lines, and he'd, they'd send a jet to pick it up back and forth, is what they did. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, where'd you go to basic at? Uh, Blackland Air Force Base. Well, I Enjoyed it. Did you? Yeah, I couldn't wait to get there. <laughs> It was nine weeks. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm basically. A you don't hear anybody in the army say that. Uh, huh? No, that's the <laughs> army for you. Air Force was different. Yeah, uh, we had good food. So, 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 how long you spent nine weeks in basic, and then you, did you go off to like AIT I, I, or something? Well, I went to uh, Amarillo Air Force Base mm -hmm. for tech training. Where's that at? I was in uh, Amarillo, it was on the Panhandle. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. oh Amarillo. Amarillo okay. Air Force yeah. Base. And uh, finished that, and I got home about two days before Christmas in 1960. And uh, I think it was January the 3rd, I had a report to Sarfage Air Force Base, and I was, that was my main duty base. So you were, than TDY. did you ever go anywhere else other than Selfridge? Other than TDY, if the, if, the, if the 94 Squadron went somewhere, I went with them. So Selfridge was pretty close to home then, right? 50 miles. Wow. It's all the world. Wow. I, I should have joined the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when you were up there, I mean, what did what you, you guys do? I mean, did you go anywhere exciting? I mean, because you said you did travel a little bit with them. Where'd you go? Uh, well, uh, exciting. Well, in 19... I'm not talking about bars and stuff. I'm talking oh, about... Oh, right, yeah, right. Okay. I understand that. <laughs> uh, well, I had a... Uh, the first time that they, uh, the squadron left, they did what they call a William Tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what a William Tell no, is? No, I have no idea. A William Tell is where the squadron would... Uh, compete against other squadrons for what okay. they call a shoot. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the support, support people had to be there. So we flew down to uh, Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, as long as they were there, we were there. Right. They flew down in their jets. We flew down in a C-123. Oh wow. Yeah. So 
I, I know you'd mentioned a little bit about the Cuban Missile Crisis. What were you doing? What happened with that? Uh, that was that was strange. Uh -huh. uh, I had just gotten engaged uh, about two weeks prior to that. To your wife? To, yeah, to my wife. We've been married 52 years. We don't want to let anything out of the bag here because she made no, no, it was 52 though. years. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I was at my duty station. We had a we worked 24 hours with 24 right. hours around the clock right. with three shifts. And I was at my duty station, and two air policemen came in. I happened to be in an air police reserve unit at the time. They came in and said, are you Paul? And I said, yeah. And they said, you come with us. Uh -oh. So I, don't know, I didn't know what was going on. So the guy that handled the 71st, I said, watch my phone. And uh, so I left, they put me in a truck. And on the way back over to the barracks where I lived at, uh, I asked them what was going on. They said, we don't know. Uh, there's two air policemen at, at the barracks now. They're cutting your lock off and they're packing your duffel bag. You're going somewhere. Wow. And uh, so I got in, sure enough, they were packing everything. So I said, how much time do I have? And they said, well, you got about five, 10 minutes. So I ran out to the parking lot where my car was, but they had a, uh, a telephone booth there. Right. So I called Barbara and I told her, I said, honey, I said, I'm going somewhere. I have no idea what was going on. And the klaxons were going off at the time because we were on alert. And she said, she said, the president is on, the, on TV and he's talking something about missiles in Cuba. That's how I found out that I was, you know, the Cuban no, crisis Cuban started crisis. for me. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So anyways, they, they packed my stuff. They took myself and another guy uh, out to the flight line and they put, me, put us in a, what they call a U3A. You know what a U3A no, is? No, I have no idea. Well, the letter U actually stands just like a U2, which mm -hmm. everybody knows. The U stands for utility. Okay. And the U3A at the time was just a twin engine uh, Cessna. Oh, okay. So we stuffed every our baggage in the back. I sat right in front with the pilot. He was a major. Mm -hmm. We flew down to uh, Barksdale Air Force Base, which was B-47s right. at the time. We landed. We had to watch them take off. We refueled and then flew out near Jacksonville. And uh, when we got out there, the major looked at me and he says, let's take her down to 500 feet. So we went down to 500 feet, flew went all the way down A-1A. Wow. And then next thing I know, he said, we're getting close to the airplane. 500 feet's really low, too. Just it's, so people, do, I mean, that is really low to fly an airplane. That's low. Yeah, yeah that was low. It was, I could see telephone yeah, poles and yeah. cars and everything yeah. else. I mean, a helicopter, you could be much lower. Right. But that's really low for and an airplane. A, a little yeah. while later, he swung out over the ocean and came in. We landed at Patrick Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which is near Cocoa Beach wow. at the time. Uh, when I got to my duty station, an officer came in. He looked at the crowds milling around, and he started counting heads. He says, there's one too many here. Are you... That's how that worked out. And I said, well, I'm in a reserve air police unit. And he said, you come with me. So it took me out to the flight line. And the next thing I know, they gave me a, a 38 pistol. I had a choice of that or a 45. Gave me a 38 pistol. And I stood at the flight line. And when a pilot would come out of the shack with his equipment, there was two air policemen with me with their M2 carbines. And uh, anyways, my job was to check the pilot, make sure that his ID was correct before we let him into the flight line area. Oh, wow. And the, and I got to tell you, this story was neat. This, it, it was 24 hours a day. I worked 12 on 12 off is the right. way it worked. And one day, this guy come out, it was in the afternoon, and they had pulled a, a U-2 not, not too far from us. It was probably, I don't know, 100 feet away at the right. most. And they started prepping this bird. And uh, this guy came out. He was in his early 50s, hardly any hair on his head. What was there was gray, a big paunch on him. He had a scowl on his face, and he's dragging his equipment. Not a happy camper. Yeah. So anyways, I saluted him. He was a major, I found out, and saluted him, asked him for his ID, and I asked him, I said, what bird are you flying, sir? He says, that damn thing. And he pointed to the U-2. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but one had been shot down over Cuba, okay. and he was told he's going to redo the flight. So that's why he wasn't smiling yeah. at the time. So anyways, uh, it was six years later. This is neat. About six years later, I'm in the insurance industry, and I'm in Detroit. I sold some insurance to a young couple, right. and the house was a duplex. And I got all done. This was in the evening, and down comes the steps was this guy with hardly any hair on his head, a pot belly on him, and a scowl on his face. And I recognized him. So wow. We, we got talking. And I found out that he was the pilot. He was a, a doctor. He spoke Russian and he spoke fluent German. And he was parachuted near the end of World War II into Berlin when it was surrounded by the Soviets. Wow. His job was, he was dressed as a German soldier. His job was to find out and identify Hitler, Goebbels, Gorin, and all the other big wigs. Well, that never happened because he ran into an SS battalion right. and wound up, wound up fighting with them 
and they was, they were at a brewery. So the story Imagine goes, that. I, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. It, it, it's so it's so bizarre. It's it's true. Yeah. And what happened was is you know of course they're fighting the Russians and every time there was a lull they had beer. So Works pretty, for me. pretty soon there was enough of them that, that were you know uh, had killed in combat and he wound up surrendering. Speaking Russian, he was able to tell them who he was. They didn't buy that. It was not until September of 45, and he was in Poland at a Russian prisoner of war camp. Finally, one day, two, two soldiers came out, dragged him into a building where he was interviewed by a Russian officer. Mm -hmm. Told him who he was, his name, his ID, and all of that. The next thing you know, the guy pressed a button, and a major walked in, an American major, <coughs> and said, come on, you're going home with me. Surprised you went up in the gulag for 20 yeah. years. The guy was amazing. 50. Uh, when I met him the second time, he was 58 years of age, so he was born in 1910. Isn't it amazing how small the world is? Though? Uh, yeah, it's strange. I mean, yeah. yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. I mean, you run into people that you'd never expect to see again in the strangest no. places. No, you so. don't. Yeah. So you got out of the service and, and, and you wound up going into the insurance business. The last day of service, how did you feel about getting out? I mean, what, what's. Uh, Excited uh, because uh, and nervous. Yeah. Uh, my wife was expecting. Okay. And I knew I wouldn't have any insurance. We were going to pay the bills, right. and I, didn't, I had job zero lined up. Right. Is what I had. Uh, so <laughs> I was nervous about that, but I, I wasn't afraid because I figured this is America. I'll right. find a job, and right. everything will work out. Right. And it did. Good. So Good. yeah. So you, so you got out and moved into the insurance business. Well, actually, I, the first uh, year I worked for the Bud Company in Detroit. Budweiser uh, or no Bud? They, they, Bud B U D D. Oh, okay. Uh, they made uh, trains. Okay. Okay. Uh, and wheels for automobiles, hubs okay. and drums and that yeah. stuff. I did that for about a year, uh, and I didn't see much of a future for me personally. Right. Uh, and wound up going in the life insurance business, straight commission. I figure if it's good, if it's straight commission, I can never get laid off. There you go. Yeah. So Forty-two years later, at age sixty-five, I retired. Retired. Yeah. So what brought you to uh, Ohio and Medina specifically? Uh, well, I went up through the ranks, and uh, I was working as a uh, assistant manager, sales manager in Detroit, and they uh, came and asked me if I'd like to uh, become a district manager and run my own shop. Uh, so they flew me down to Richmond, Virginia, where the home office mm -hmm. was. I interviewed there. And they offered me the Cleveland district in Akron. Okay. So I had about 40 employees. Uh, it was a big learning lesson, and that's what brought us to a Cleveland. So how long have you been in Medina now? Uh, well, it took two times. We okay. uh, lived here. Uh, let's see. Lived here for about uh, 12 years. Uh, I had, a, uh, make a long story short, I had an opportunity to go to North Carolina. The kids were grown and gone. It was winter, so what the heck, right? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, it was, and I'm uh, not a golfer, but right. it's a great place yeah. to go. Yeah. So anyways, I uh, went down there, and I spent seven years there, uh, and then we had a granddaughter that was born, because my daughter stayed in, in uh, Medina mm -hmm. area. She lives in Brunswick today, uh, stayed here, and then, of course, had a baby. So every time we had a three-day weekend, it was come drive one day, the look, and then drive yeah. back. Yeah. That got old, so I had an opportunity to come back to Ohio. Uh, I went to work back up here. And we're glad to have you because I know you do a lot here for our veterans and stuff, very instrumental uh, and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, so. The problem was is when I was working, my hours were so uh, you know, unregulated right. that I couldn't get out outside uh, opportunities. Yeah. But when I retired, I saw a little tiny ad in the newspaper, the local newspaper, and it talked about the Vietnam Veterans of America, mm -hmm. Chapter 385, and uh, come to a meeting. Well, I didn't serve in Vietnam, but I was in during the war. Right. So I went to the meeting and quickly found out that this is where I belonged. Mm -hmm. And you also belong to any other groups? I uh, belong to AMVETS. I'm AMVETS? vice president okay. there, okay, chapter 1990, right. and I belong to American Legion, chapter 202. So, let, you know, your career, and let's just kind of back up to the military. What did you take away from the military that made you so successful? Discipline. Discipline? So you, 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 you that's think that's been carried yeah. away? Yeah. yeah, I came in as a boy, went out as a man. Yeah, it does change it, doesn't it? Big time. Even, even just a couple years changes. Actually, a couple weeks changes. <laughs> <laughs> Boot camp changes yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It does. It, it makes you look at life a little yeah, bit different. Yeah, it's true. So tell me a little bit about what the VVA and, and AMVETS and all those groups do for not just you, but for the community. I mean, I know that there's two sides of, of all the veterans groups. And one is, right. you know, what, what you walk away with it, but then also what... The, you know, they put back towards the community. Well, the, the big thing is, is that they, number one, support each other. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have someone that goes overseas, uh, we'll contact the family. Right. Uh, do they have someone to mow the yard? 
uh, you know, shovel the sidewalks or something like that. Right. Uh, do they need money? Pay a, pay a bill, that type of thing. Uh, we're redoing the hall, as you're probably well aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. the Medina Veterans Hall in, in, in right. Medina, right? Yeah, it's Medina County Veterans right. Memorial Hall. Redoing that. Uh, phase one will finish uh, probably in May of this year. Mm -hmm. Which okay. is hopefully a couple weeks from now. Uh, that'd be nice. <laughs> in my, my bet is May. Right. Uh, then when the hall is finished, okay, we've already contacted a couple of uh, places where they have veterans that are shut-ins. Mm -hmm and uh, made arrangements where they can bring them in uh, on a monthly basis. Well, we'll feed them a lunch, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, have some entertainment for them. We, one of the things we have that we're, we brought in or be able to bring in is an 11-foot television screen. Wow. So I don't care where you are in the hall, you're gonna be able to see, you're be able to see the TV. Yeah. yeah, so we'll feed them lunch and then entertain them for the day and then uh, take them back at that That'd point be nice. time. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. You know, I, I, know um, I know some of the groups have tried to get like people out of the assisted livings to their meetings and stuff. Right. And actually some of them have started to have meetings in the assisted livings. Right. Um, I was talking to some friends back in New York and they said that they do a meeting that kind of, it's like an ad hoc meeting where they bring in people from three or four nursing homes and assisted living mm -hmm. and they just do a meeting with a group of them. And it really isn't a function of any one of the other right. groups, right. but it's just to, to make the guys know that they're a part of yeah, our goal is to get them out of groups, there yeah. and bring them into right. a different environment, and it'd be, yeah, it'd be uh, which would be a new home for yeah. them. Uh, Dave Taylor, uh, who runs our capital campaign, mm -hmm. okay, the fundraising part. I help him with it, but I'm just his gopher, to be right. very frank about it. <laughs> uh, which is, which and is he's doing a great job with the oh, fundraising. Phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, uh, he, but anyway, he's a, he's a terrific guy. Uh, we've already been in contact with two schools in the area, mm -hmm. uh, one for the fifth graders and one for the eighth graders. So when we finished the hall, uh, we were in contact with the Historical Society and uh, they have talked to us about bringing uniforms in and information from the Civil War oh, wow. all the way through all the wars right up to the war on terrorism. So that the, the kids in the fifth grade and eighth grade, they can have a field day, get on the bus, come to the hall, and get a little education about what Medina County veterans in the past and up till today have done for their freedom. Well, I know the Medina Historical Society has a, 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 a lot, I don't wanna say a ton, but they have a lot of stuff Right. that's not on display because they just don't have the room to display it. Right. And it'd be great to be able to get some yeah. of that, those things. I mean, they got a lot of Civil War things too. Right. Um, they actually yeah. have the original American Legion plaque from that building. I, that I didn't, yeah. Yeah. Um, that I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know. It, it would be yeah. great to get some of that stuff out for yeah. people to see that don't go to the historical society. I think sometimes. Well, yeah, and, and you know, people need to know what veterans have done in the past and right. what they even do today. Just because you serve in the military doesn't mean that it's, it's all over with. Right. Okay. It's just like I, several of my friends at the hall are uh, Marines, mm -hmm. and the, they're saying is once a Marine, always a Marine. Right. And that's, I, I, I envy that. Well, really I, I think, you know, veterans know, I, I think more than a lot of people, they know how important community is. Mm -hmm. um, because when you are in the military, it is a very small, tight-knit community. Right. So they bring yeah. those things back yeah. home. Yeah. And they continue to give, whether it's, you know, in the local community serving mm -hmm. a pancake breakfast or whether it's running for public well, office. They, uh, we, they have a, we have an honor guard through the American Legion mm -hmm. Chapter 202. Uh, and Which is out of that hall, by the way. Yeah. It's out of that hall. Yeah. Ray Hewitt is the captain, mm -hmm. uh, and they're out there. I don't care if it's 365 days out of right. the week, they will be there. Right. Okay. Uh, so they can provide the honors for a, a, for a veteran that had passed away. Yeah, they do uh, a great job. I know all, all, all the honor guards they do. throughout the county do a great job, and, yeah. and you know it's amazing. They're down at the cemetery in the the, the thick of the cold and snow. Yep and mm -hmm. the, the extreme heat in the summertime. Yeah, and you're carrying a nine pound yeah. M1 rifle. Yeah. And it's funny because when I talk to people, they're like, oh yeah, those soldiers over there. And I'm kind of like, oh, they're volunteers. And, and you know, they start <laughs> looking and they're like, oh, I, I thought some of them looked a little bit old. I'm like, <laughs> you know, the average age is probably 60, 70 years old for uh, some of those guys. The, the youngest one served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, the oldest one is a Korean War veteran. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So and these they, guys they, are in their 60s and, and 70s. They're there, yeah. yeah. Nobody gets paid. Uh, the money that we use to raise the, the money mm -hmm. uh, for the hall, right. uh, each of the chapters donated a thousand dollars of their own own right. cash, and Home Corps, which manages the hall, right. uh, we turned in three thousand dollars of our own money. So we had seven thousand dollars that we used to raise the funds, okay, to build the hall. Right. 
Yeah. And I know Dave's, I don't know what his final amount is, but I know he's upwards of $400,000 or something uh, like that. Well, for the phase one, we needed 400000 We raised 406000 Right. Phase two would be 150000 but we already had six of it, so we need 144000 So the fundraising is still going on. We'll get, yes. If anybody wants to donate, you can contact uh, the hall there, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to <laughs> take that donation to continue to build the hall. And it's tax deductible. Uh, there you go. So... Memorial Day is coming up. What's the function of AMVETS and VVA? And I mean, why is, I mean, that, you know, May is the season of veterans, really. Right. I mean, for, we have all, every weekend there's something going on. Well, the VVA chapters are going to be heavily involved on it, as you well know. Right. Okay. Uh, so there, uh, we have uh, the, the wall coming in. Right. Which, Next month in June. In yeah. June, we'll be here. Uh, they uh, always are in the parades. Right. Uh, some of them have to ride, but they're there. They're, yep. Yeah, and some of them walk. And that, they, some of them know, walk. And you, they, they all know how to salute. Right, and they and they walk. You know, it's a, what about two, three miles? I think the parade yeah. route, a couple mm -hmm. miles. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing to see some of those guys get out there and salute. I always, always see youngsters when they don't want to stand for the national anthem. I always tell them you know, there's a lot of people that can barely stand, but they still get out of their wheelchairs. They, yeah, they do. They so, do. And that, that puts a tear yeah, in your eye. Yeah, if you're capable to do it, you ought to get off your butt and stand up for it. You know? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, that, that shows your love of country. Yeah, it does. And respect for, you know, you know, for the country, which is, you know, for those of us that have been elsewhere, it's mm -hmm. the greatest nation on earth, even with all our faults. Uh, it doesn't get right. any better than but, this. Yeah, and I don't see anybody trying to leave the country. No, no. And, um, and, and there's a lot of people that have sacrificed, so out of respect for those sacrifices. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, I lost my father, my grandfather, in the First World War. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, my family, most of them came here just uh, back in the 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think people realize how, you know, and even still today, I mean, it's a little different, but how people fight to get to this country. Um, yeah. You know, and, and even today, but you go back years and years, you know, you go back to the, you know, the, the big immigration in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, you know, can you imagine putting your kids on a boat and going goodbye? And not going to see them again. Knowing that right. life is going to be better for yeah. them, or at yeah. least they're going to have a chance. Mm -hmm. And wherever you're at today, they don't have that yeah. chance. And, right. that, and I don't think yeah. a lot of people realize that. All my ancestors came from Germany except mm -hmm. one, one grandfather. Uh, he was 12 years of age right. and came over on a boat yeah. with a ticket in his hand. Okay. And it came from Cork, Ireland. And so goodbye to his family, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's a lot of that going. Or, or you hit Ellis Island, and you know they tell you, well, you know, mom and the kids can go, but this kid and dad can't. They got to go back. That's and, true. And yeah. you go goodbye. I mean, and that's it. You know. Well, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they only had the quotas at that time. Mm -hmm. So on my father's side, uh, they had to live in Canada for two years before they could come. Before that, the numbers were worked out that they could come, and wow. they moved to Wisconsin, where my mother and dad were both uh, raised. That is amazing. Yeah. Absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So any ad advice for, you know, the youngsters out there, you know, either wanting to go into the military or maybe getting out as far as the veterans groups or anything like that? I mean, uh, for young people out of school, uh, to me, uh, it, it's probably the greatest thing you could do. Mm -hmm. uh, it, join the military. Uh, join the military. Yeah. Uh, you have an opportunity to see the world. Or, like me, you might wind up 50 miles from home. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, I have one friend that uh, went in the year after I did. And uh, we're still friends. I have known right. him for, we grew up together. Right. And uh, he lives in Florida, he's retired. Uh, and he wound up uh, on a rock island, mm -hmm. about uh, half a mile long, quarter mile wide, no trees, just bushes. Wow. But it was in the Bering Straits and they had a radar site there. Wow. So if the Soviet bombers were right. coming over, they the first he, ones he to spot pick it up. He would pick That's it up. where he spent three years. I'll be damned. Yeah. Wow. I don't think I want so, to be in the Bering Straits. It's pretty cold up there. No, but when you go in the military, <laughs> the neat thing is you go in the military, you, you do the job they train you to yeah. do, and you go where they need you the most. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's serving your country. Well, you come out with a different perspective on life, too. You do. No matter, yeah. no matter where you serve or what you do, you do have a different outlook on it. You do, on, on and you come stuff. back, and you're grateful for your being born and living in this country. So what about the groups? I know, uh, I know the veterans organizations with the younger guys, I mean, and gals. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, numbers are down it, for everybody. You know, whether it's a Masonic group, the Rotary, or mm -hmm. the VFW or American Legion. What's it take to get the, the young people today to come out and join? I mean, what do you think? Well, right now, uh, 
what we're trying to do is by redoing the hall, mm -hmm. okay, modernizing it is what we'd love to do is to, to build another chapter, right? Okay, with the, we can't do it ourselves, but we'd like to get guys that served in, in Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, to build a chapter so they can use their hall. And gals, there's a lot of, I'll tell you, there's no, a lot oh, of women in the military. Yeah, a whole so, lot of yeah, women, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, we have the Blue Star Mothers, mm -hmm. okay, and the Gold Star Mothers. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's groups that can, you know, we can work with and they can help us. So you're trying to track like the Iraqi, Afghanistan, yes. vets, well, Persian yeah. Gulf veterans type mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, that's yeah. good, that's mm -hmm. good. It'd be good to see them come out and, and put something together and hopefully utilize the space there. Um, and carry on the mission of, of the other groups. Well, it, it, it's basically, it's veterans helping veterans, mm -hmm. okay, and it's veterans helping the community that right. they live in. Yeah. And, and, and we try to highlight that a lot. I mean, the veterans do a lot in the community. Mm -hmm. And we try to, that, I mean, that's one of the reasons we started the show is so that we could show the community how much we do do. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of activity out there with the vets. Any last words of... Uh, 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 well, if I had my do it all over again, I'd join the Air Force. <laughs> If I had to do it all over again, I'd still join the Army. <laughs> Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Thank right? you so much. I enjoyed it. You all have a good Memorial Day. We'll see you out there this month someplace, I'm sure, and we'll see you next okay. month on Salute to Service. What's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late.